Hi everyone, uh, my name is Christian Lagas and I'm a freelance user experience designer. And I wanted to start off today with, you know, just a bit of a story, not of the content migration itself, but uh, just the project that I worked on prior to that. So in 2011 and 2012, I was working at a large telco. And, uh, you know, at the time we were tasked with building a, a, a customer support knowledge, uh, knowledge base. And, you know, we were creating it using responsive web design techniques. And so, you know, at the time this was actually quite new and exciting because the only things or the only major sites that were, that were responsive were, was the Barack Obama site and the Boston Globe. And so we spent several weeks learning about, you know, responsive web design, trying to be, you know, mobile first and just generally breaking down our desktop centric thinking. And so our deadline was tight and many compromises were made, you know, as is typical of many projects. We're actually quite literally locked into a room. So there was about six of us uh, given six weeks to produce this thing. And so you can imagine how tight the deadline was. And so launch day came and the system that we designed, you know, was going to be put in front of users. And so both the editors, uh, sorry, not in, it was going to be put in front of users. So both the editors uh, who would be creating the content and our customers. And, you know, it all really fell apart. Uh, and it was all because of one word. Uh, well, it was actually two words. And <laughs> what we failed to realize that our content editors were just simply copying and pasting from Word documents. You know, they were bypassing our carefully crafted HTML templates. And so what we ended up with was, you know, uh, about 200 support articles with malformed HTML, uh, broken content, and no mobile version. And uh, what happened was basically the project team, so everyone from, say, the designers up into the project leaders, so my boss, was uh, sort of on the ground floor in the CMS hand editing those HTML pages just to get it working. So why am I bringing this up? Uh, well, for starters, I became a real expert in you know, regex syntax and I just had to tell someone. Uh, but but <laughs> More importantly, we were so focused on how amazing the experience would be for the end user uh, that, you know, we neglected to think about the real users, uh, you know, i.e. the content editors and the producers. So you might be thinking, you know, this, is, this could all have easily been solved with a single button. But I think it goes much deeper than that. You know, like, why were people actively avoiding the tools that we created, you know, that we created specifically to help them do their job? So I've been working as a front-end developer for a couple of years and more recently as a UX designer. And uh, in my experience, you know, implementing a new CMS has always really been about you know, technology first and less about the poor suckers who have to use the damn thing every day. I know personally, I have a tendency to design things from the outside in. You know, just I often catch myself building a solution in my head you know, rather than spending time and thinking about the underlying problem that I'm trying to solve and also the people that I'm trying to solve it for. So I'm also equally guilty of putting together wireframes and Photoshop comps, you know, just filled with lorem ipsum. I'm always assuming that, you know, someone else will take care of this. They'll just fill in the boxes and I don't have to worry about it. So all of this was just really front and center in my head as we moved on to our next project, which was the content migration that I'll get to. And I'm hoping that, you know, if you're a designer, a developer, a BA, a strategist, you know, whoever, and if you've got some influence or any input into, you know, similar projects, that uh, today will give you some things to think about. So regardless of the CMS that you use. And I also wanted to share this as an example of, you know, it was change that wasn't necessarily grand or ambitious or even overly transformative. You know, our reasons at the time weren't necessarily to redo the entire website, provide a brand new experience. But it was simply to just move away from the system that we were on because we didn't like it, we didn't want to pay for it. And you know, despite all of that, we were still able to create meaningful change and improvements to both content producers and editors and also our end customers. So let's talk about the project. 
So what was involved was, uh, you know, it was approximately a thousand pages that had to be manually moved over. Uh, it was multiple visual styles, uh, some dating back from about 2006. There was outdated content and there was, about, uh, there was a disorganized IA just from years of sort of neglect and just any real lack of structure. The core team was comprised of uh, you know, one UX designer, visual designer, a couple of front-end developers, a back-end developer or two, uh, some producers, one tester and a business analyst. And towards the end of the project, you know, as the actual migration of pages was ramping up, we added a bunch of visual designers and about 10 more editors. And the project itself was broken down into roughly three phases over seven months. So we had the content audit uh, that ran from January to March. There was a design and development phase from about March to May and the migration, the actual migration from April to July. And it's probably important to note that there was a lot of overlap between the phases. So, you know, design work would often bleed into the migration phase. Now, guiding principle. So we knew that this was a great opportunity for us to improve what was on the website because it was, it was a bit of a schmozzle. So there was, uh, there was things that we knew we could tackle um, and also, you know, just things to improve because we had customer testing done over the years. Um, you know, we had this raw set of data of, of how people sort of thought of the website. Uh, but the underlying uh, motivation for this was, you know, it was just a straight up migration. We were moving from one system to another, but we couldn't ignore how, you know, the opportunity that, that we had. So we established this guiding principle of, you know, what must be migrated uh, should be equal to or better than the current experience. So we knew that a lot of people, stakeholders, product managers and so on, would see this as their opportunity to get a new website. So we had to manage this and basically manage their expectations. So what were the challenges? Uh, well, we had many, but um, I'll just pick out a couple and talk through in, in a little bit more detail. Question, how do you design for a system that you've never seen, let alone use? Now, this might sound very strange, but uh, we didn't actually get our hands on a sandboxed environment until about three months into the project, and we had to fight for it. Uh, we you know, were, were building all these things, we were designing all these things without actually knowing where it would land and how it would be implemented. And so you know, we were pushing to Basically, you know, get these things, uh, well, get, we're pushing to, to get these things live. And, uh, and where we started with was seeking feedback from the users. So, you know, we were talking to the producer team and given the way that the internal team is structured, uh, meant that me as a UX designer, you know, I had zero exposure to the actual CMS. So I was designing all these things, you know, modules, pages, sites, and so on, uh, without really fully understanding how they would be implemented. And so we talked to them about their experience, what their workflow was like, you know, where their pain points were, and in short, the overall feedback that we got from them was. <laughs> so our content producers had a tough job. You know, I have to hand it to them. Um, they were editing raw HTML to make content updates. So it wasn't exactly you know, a Dreamweaver style of editing, but it was more like Windows Notepad. <laughs> you know, it was a process that really could be described as inefficient, you know, requiring a certain skill set and very prone to mistakes. So we started looking at different ways of building these pages and just really addressing the producer pain points. And you know, because everything was being moved over manually, we had to stop and ask, how do we build this? And you know, we would start with the producers and often the answer would be, well, I would just get the HTML code from the developers and we just chuck it into the CMS. So what we've got here is the most recent version of pricing tables. This is the nice version. Um, what we had previous to that 
was just inconsistent and generally a mess. So it was a prime candidate for us to improve, uh, to improve this particular piece of content during the migration. We didn't want to just move it over one for one. But we had some things to consider. For starters, you know, this content would be reused across multiple pages. We had to account for the different types of content that this module would display. We also didn't want to spook the product managers. So the product managers and the marketing team had very little exposure to our migration project. So our thought was if we started coming in and just sort of waving our fancy new redesigns in their face and saying this is what's going to this is what's going to happen, you know, we get pulled into this endless loop of feedback cycles and approval chains. And we also had legal implications because telco as an industry is very heavily regulated. You know, so we had to tread carefully. So this is a bit of a failure story on my part, but hear me out. So when thinking about the different interfaces that we could build for the CMS, my first thought was, hey, let's use a spreadsheet. You know, looks close enough. Uh, you know, things are being presented in table format. We could, you know, do up a couple of spreadsheets for all the different pricing tables that we had and just import them you know, quite quickly and easily. So I went ahead and started designing a tool that would you know, take a spreadsheet of pricing information and sort of add it to the CMS. Did it work? It, the idea really didn't resonate with our editors um, for a couple of reasons. For starters, none of the content producers could use Excel in their day-to-day -day work, or rather they weren't using Excel uh, in their day-to-day -day work. They were using Photoshop, they were using this god-awful CMS editor, but not, ex not Excel. So if we forced them to change their behaviors, uh, we'd get a lot of resistance. Second of all, we could get the content in very quickly, no dramas, but it was impossible for us to get it out. Uh, you know, if we made a mistake or we needed to modify the data structure or so on, it became really impossible. And lastly, while it worked for numerical content, it really didn't work for anything else. So any other text content, like legal terms and conditions and so on, just didn't fly. So in the end, what we ended up doing, and apologies for the rough sketch, but I think this was the standard of the documentation that we were producing as part of this process. Uh, I can show you my sketchbook. But um, in the end, what we ended up going down with was you know, a relatively simple and structured set of data, but we broke it down into smaller, more atomic bits. So for example, the features were sort of their own thing, um, you know, individual fields, and uh, you, know, you could apply those to a certain number of plans with a bit of extra data on top. And if you wanted to combine them into multiple plans, so say you had a variation over 12 months or 24 months, you could combine multiple plans onto a page so you would get this particular layout. And we also had rules around the module that if there was, say, more than four uh, being displayed at one time, we would have this fancy um, sort of scrolling mechanism that would just cut off the fifth and sixth and seventh elements just so that we would indicate that there was actually more there. So it wasn't the prettiest, but it worked. and. You know, as I said, we had to stay true to what had already been there because if we started redesigning this in, in, uh, you know, from scratch, uh, we, would, we wouldn't get anywhere because we'd have the product guys to deal with, basically. So this got me thinking about other examples of you know, content editing tools. And I came across this one for the ITV News, which is... Uh, a news service for a British channel. And uh, in 2012, you know, they launched their news service and it was fundamentally different from typical news sites. So without going into too much detail, uh, the site was structured more around issues and events rather than just publishing new news articles on a given day. So for example, you could follow the Egyptian uprising uh, over time from its inception right through to know the aftermath with tweets photos and so on 
the agency that was responsible for this redesign, um, I think they're a British mob called Made by Many. Uh, they spent a lot of time thinking about how journalists worked and crafted the tools to suit how they worked. They shadowed the journalists in the newsroom and even ran their own test feeds for a while. They prototyped and tested these tools with the people who would be using them. And the tools that they created were designed to allow journalists to focus more on finding and creating content rather than fighting the CMS. So what we've got there is just a very basic post editor with very basic styling. So you can only do bold, italic, and links. What you see underneath is just sort of more structured data. So you can include multiple posts, tweets, quotes, and whatnot. You can also drag and drop and rearrange them. So if you wanted to, to include a range of uh, tweets or reactions, you could do so. This is a prototype of their, their picture editor. So instead of having to find an image, you know, find out what the editorial size would be, because you know they don't have that on hand, crop the image, save it in an appropriate format, make sure it's compressed nicely, find out where they saved the file, upload it, check it to see on screen, re-upload it if it doesn't look right. You know, this tool took care of a lot of this so they didn't have to. And they also realized that people who were out in the field didn't necessarily have access to a laptop. They often just had their smartphone on them. And so the designers created this tool to allow journalists to quickly send content to the newsroom where the web team could collate and curate streams of content coming in. So there was this idea of, you know, allowing the journalists to go out there and just worry about gathering while the guys back at home base would put everything together into a sort of coherent picture. So a couple of thoughts. For us, as part of this project, understanding how your users worked became really fundamental for us to make any progress. You know, we sat with them, talked with them, sometimes had a beer, several. Um, you know, we, and as a result, you know, we were creating new tools and processes, and we were trying to change how they work, often for the better, but, uh, you know, if we were pushing too hard or if we were pushing them in ways which, you know, they weren't used to or it just didn't sit, you know, we would get resistance. So we had to find out where the edges were. And I think that came down to just listening to how they, you know, what their frustrations were. Finally, you know, you're creating, sorry, um, these content creation tools, you know, can we make them more interesting, compelling, efficient? You know, can we do other things than just simply filling out a form? Question. So with many stakeholders, you know, how could we keep everyone focused and moving in the same direction? So this project was a bit of a bastard. Actually, it was, it was, it was, it was a mess. But you know, I, I think it goes without saying that you know, it was a really highly political project. We had people in multiple parts of the business with a vested interest in, uh, in the success, sometimes a failure. Um, but this also affected people's day-to-day -day work. And you know, there was also legal implications to consider. So given the far-reaching nature of this project, you know, how could we make sure that uh, everything, or rather everyone, you know, that needed to be kept in the loop was being done so? For us, Physical space was uh, really effective in not only getting the core team to focus on what needed to be done in any one given sprint, but also getting external stakeholders and even the greater online team on board with what we were doing. How we've typically done things, this may seem familiar to you guys, but uh, you know the UX designers would come up with a bunch of wireframes, who would throw it over to the design guys to make it pretty, we throw it over to the dev guys to build the thing, and then the back end guys would get involved and uh, make it happen. Testing guys would jump in there, and then the production guys would make it live. You know, your standard waterfall process. Given what we had, which was three months during the development phase, just out of sheer necessity, 
you know, collaboration between designer, developer, t tester, and producer became very important. You know, we had UX designers working with backend designers, sketching out potential solutions. The visual designers were working with producers to try and understand how to upload images into the CMS. All of this was actually quite new for us. And, and typically how we did, sorry, it wasn't how we did things in the past. We really couldn't afford to have instances where designers or developers would basically say, you know, I'm not gonna start work until I see wireframes. Sometimes a sketch should be all you need to get people to start working. And if there was another level of detail that was needed, so for instance, the testers needed uh, you know, functional specs and so on, it was called out early and often. And it also really didn't hurt that we were sitting in the same area rather than it being siloed out. This became a bit of a mantra for us. So we used uh, a Kanban board to kind of keep track of who was responsible for each bit of functionality. So if you're not familiar with this, it's just basically a whiteboard uh, split up into you know the steps, UX, uh, design, dev, going down the track, and using uh, user cards or user stories to basically identify what stage of the process uh, certain things were. So at the start of any given sprint, we would prioritize these user cards. We, we would identify the goals that we wanted to hit. And we'd use daily stand-ups to identify any potential blockers. And you know, we had many conversations outside of that to kind of collectively reach agreements on where we would do things. So it, was, it wasn't uncommon for us to, uh, you know, if I was working on a particular module, like say a Twitter feed, uh, I would say, you know, pull in the, the design guys and dev guys and say, look, here is what I've got sketched out. What do you think? And they would say, no, that's bullshit, that won't work. Or they would say, okay, let's go with that. And they themselves would get started on the work that they needed to do so that when it came to them, they were already ahead. We also set up design walls and other spaces. Uh, and we use these to get buy-in from external stakeholders. We use it also to keep everyone up to date with our progress. And we sort of use this as a finish line for everyone. We printed IAs, we stuck designs on the wall, sketches, everything. We printed out every page that we were moving over and used this to talk managers through how the migration would affect their content. So it wasn't uncommon for us to invite a couple of uh, product managers over and we basically walk them through the current version of their site and also what we were proposing as the new IA for their site. And what became apparent was, you know, as soon as we talked them through, as soon as, you know, they saw these, these pages in front of them, they'd start immediately saying, wow, that stuff's out of date. <laughs> and and these, they were responsible for these sorts of things. Like, this was their content. This was their product. And they had no idea on, on what their site or their product looked to users. And, you know, we found this as, a little bit more effective than just sending over a, uh, a bunch of uh, spreadsheets, kind of hoping that they would respond. And it really also helped that we were only just a level or two above them physically. So we use this as clear agreement on where we would improve things and where we would leave things as is. We also use this as a way of you know, promoting the project internally as there wasn't a lot of visibility outwards. So, you know, we were trying to be transparent, create a greater sense of ownership across the online team. Uh, you know, it was, uh, it was a project that was, you know, it was just working, the core team was just working on this. And so what we found was having this awareness, having this in a public place. So this was actually in the main sort of kitchen area know, it created a greater sense of ownership across the online team. And people were having conversations around it. You know, they were working out how this affected their work. You know, people could see the potential improvements and sort of how dramatic it was compared to the old version. You know, there was real excitement. And often, you know, they would have conversations outside of the team, which was great because they didn't need to talk to me. 
And when it came down to the tail end of the project, when uh, you know, we were getting the migration and we were just pumping out pages, it was all hands on deck. So we weren't necessarily trying to be agile with a capital A. You know, what we were doing made sense to us. Uh, I admit I'm really not uh, too sort of, I don't know a lot about agile methodology. I appreciate some of the things that it, it promotes. So things like, you know, um, interactions over, over rigid specs, um, you know, being adaptable, adaptable. And, you know, just the greater focus on communication. And by the same token, you know, we instilled this culture of, you know, communicating to others. So if someone needed something from me about what I need, so what I needed to produce to get their job done, they would call it out early and often. And finally, you know, using physical space to reach consensus and buy-in was also a big one for us. Question. You know, what's the best way to get a team of new producers up to speed on a project? So as I mentioned earlier, uh, the project started off with two producers but would ramp up over time with more producers being brought in. So these producers wouldn't have the tacit knowledge that the core team had. And often they were just contractors being brought in specifically for this project. So how do we get them up to speed in a short time? For us, it was wireframes and a patent library. So because the core team had to understand how content producers were putting these pages together, and as much as I dislike wireframing, you know, every page that we moved over was, had, had a, um, an associated wireframe because so, so much of the source content was so different, we saw this as the only way. We couldn't get the produce guys to basically look at the original file because they often couldn't work out how it would be built with the new system. So we created a patent library of reusable elements, so things like content modules, baseline grids, and page types, which meant the producers didn't have to think about how each page would be built. So just to quickly run through the benefits of establishing a patent library. Shared vocabulary. When you say link box and I say link box, you know, we know we're talking about the same thing. Consistency of experience. When I hover my mouse over a link box, it operates in the same way. <coughs> Rapidly train new people. Here's how to create a new link box. Avoid reinventing the wheel. What if the link box has multiple links? What if it has no image? And finally, empowering content producers, which is sort of a little bit at odds with what I just said previously. But what we found was, again, because the content was so varied, uh, pre-migration, you know, we basically established this framework so that we could let the producers make their own decisions about how something could be built. And if it was 80% 80, 80 of the way, you know, and, and it didn't look horribly broken, you know, we were okay with that. And often this would be applied to, say, lower level pages or stuff that was generally considered a low priority as far as uh, how useful it was to customers. So this is an example of patent library that I put together. Um, so this style, uh, is generally a little bit more sort of casual in tone. You know, I tried to make it less like a piece of statute and more, you know, just a set of recommendations. I tried to keep it succinct. And I also wanted to include examples in line so people could see when I talk about hover states and, you know, clickable label elements, you know, they could see how they worked. So a couple of other examples. The BBC gel was, for me, the inspiration for the patent library. So when I sort of put this thing together, I looked to the BBC gel. And you know, when I saw it, I thought, yes, brilliant. This is exactly what I want. This is how I want to communicate. Um, you know, they, they're, they're solving the same problems that I'm trying to. You know, it was a focus less on actual code, but more defining the overall language uh, for things like carousels, typography, other core page elements. 
You know, it also defined how things should work across different contexts, you know, mobile and TV. And when you drill down to the individual components, you know, they gave you variations based on, you know, if you were doing a, a carousel with no images and just text, this is how it works. If you're doing them with just images, this is how it works. And so on, and they weren't sort of being so rigid in their, in their designs, which made sense because they had so many, uh, so many different types of sites to deal with. So compare this with the Starbucks style guide, which is a little bit more developer centric. So you can see different page configurations, you know, drill down into specific CSS, show the grid overlay, and demonstrate how things would reshape on different screens. Just a reminder, uh, you know, don't just set and forget. Invest effort in maintaining the library. You know, if you set one of these up, uh, work out who's going to be the patent librarian. You know, who's going to maintain this over time. Know, start thinking about how decisions are made as far as putting new things into the patent library. And you can bet that already established patterns may break with either new types of content or even new devices. So you need to be prepared for that. And also keep it in a centralized and visible place. So whether or not it's a, a public URL or a place that is, say, on the intranet or even just you know, hand like printed documents that you give to a new person when they start. You know, it needs to be visible. It needs to be sort of reinforced over time. And also, never stop selling the benefits of the patent library to stakeholders. So we found this really useful when, again, God love them, uh, dealing with marketing people and the product guys. Uh, so they would often come to us with, you know, we need this campaign up immediately. And so we'd say, yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, but you should really follow it in this format. And, you know, we can take care of that for you. So for things like, you know, competition pages, any sales and so on, it really helps like, you know, just repetitive content that is maybe just created every couple of weeks and so on. You know, it really saved us time and yeah. And finally, how can we make things future friendly? So the company I worked for, we sold mobile phones. So it was a bit mind-boggling that you know our content wasn't really optimized for the devices that we were trying to sell to people. You know, all we had was it was just some shitty, almost, I guess, website that was uh, probably built for Nokia phones. So at the start of the project, you know, we had high hopes that you know we could work in a mobile version of the site. You know, we could develop this in tandem, make things responsive. However, however you you see it. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, it was descoped at the very start of the project, which was a bit discouraging for us, you know, given the previous work that we'd done. But what we could do was lay the foundations for future mobile work. So, just a quick reminder, mobile does not equal lights. Uh, you know, we shouldn't assume intent based solely on the device that we use, and as a result, hide content accordingly. Laptops often run off 3G connections and smartphones, you know, they're commonly connected to Wi-Fi. So I'm not going to belabor the point because there's many other far smarter people who have already spoken about this at great length. But what I will talk about is how we approach the project, sorry, how we approach this during the project. So for us, we limited HTML usage or rather WYSIWYG HTML usage and we structured content and we started identifying page types. So we made the decision uh, that we wanted to basically avoid WYSIWYG where we could for a couple of reasons. You know, the visual designers were worried about uh, the wrong styling, the wrong look being applied at the time of production. The developer guys were worried about code bloat and performance. And I was worried about you know, this ruining our chances for any sort of mobile version. So, you know, we were happy that everyone was on the same page. And, you know, I was quite happy to get rid of the inline CK editor. The second thing we did was look for patterns in content. 
We identified pages that didn't need anything beyond a simple edit box, so we called these flex boxes. We started looking at landing pages, you know, uh, bespoke pages that had a lot of custom HTML. And this allowed us to understand, you know, just how much work was involved, what areas of the site might need mobile specific templates, or where we could just use responsive styling. And it also gave us uh, sort of a list of pages that we could just start giving to uh, the production guys just to start moving them over. And the last thing we did was sort of dive deeper into certain page types and create content rules around them. So this is a, a, a almost a functional spec of the pricing table that I showed you earlier. And we use this to communicate uh, to the developers and the producers, you know, just how uh, content would be used in certain areas. So for example, you know, we use it to define uh, link states, what could be edited, what remains static, you know, um, and, and what happened in certain situations. And our hope was that when a mobile version was to be developed, you know, whoever was taking care of that, we didn't need to second guess the kind of data that they were working with. So, how did we do? Wasn't too bad. So, of the four development sprints that we had, you know, we managed to hit the targets that we set out in each sprint. The site went live in about August last year, and you know, there's been considerable improvements to the internal processes, and, and the site itself is a little less bloated and a little, a uh, little more robust. And as I understand it, the patent library is being actively maintained. And you know the beginnings of a mobile optimized version is already live, and it's drawing from the same pool of content as the desktop website. So it's good news. And to reflect on you know what's happened over the last two years, I'm really quite proud of what we were able to achieve. You know this experience challenged the way I worked, and got me thinking less about specific deliverables and more about you know the relationships that I had with the people around me. You know, a lot of the challenges that we faced as a team were more about communication and less about you know, technical challenges. And we skipped the typical waterfall approach in favor of you know, more cross-discipline collaboration uh, and type feedback loops with the end users. So not only did we uh, test our ideas and concepts with the producers, we also did usability testing on, uh, on the new and improved pricing tables that we put out. We created and established a design vocabulary and enshrined them in a resource that was to be used across the team. And we also tried to ensure that our content was created and stored in a way that could be reusable and adaptable. And finally, you know, working in an organization like I did on such a project meant that as a designer, you very quickly learn to become very pragmatic and take the wins where you can get them. You know, if you always reach for best practice, you're going to be very disappointed only because, you know, there's so many other factors involved and, you know, you need to know when to push and when to yield. That's all I got. Assets in total. Uh, so I don't know specific assets. So if you mean things like PDF files and so on, we have that in a spreadsheet somewhere. Um, but it was, yeah, for, so for every page, there often had to be like specific oh, items, uh, about a thousand. Um, but that also included, um, yeah, it also included things like the uh, yeah images, PDFs, and things like that. Sorry, what do you mean by that? It wasn't a Drupal site. Gotcha. <laughs> um, no, yeah, it wasn't. We we basically um, we had to move things over manually. So it uh, effectively recreating each page in the new system. We couldn't use anything like uh, you know a database drop, you know lift and drop, which at the very start of the project was what everyone had thought 
this project would be. It was just simply carrying a, a database over to the new system and just putting the, the CMS on top. Um, but no, it was we had to manually recreate everything, which sort of amplified the complexity of the project so much. So the question was, why didn't we know what the the CMS was? We knew what the system what the system was. It just wasn't up and operational. So we knew that we were working on this system. Um, uh, crikey, it's um, we went from Stellan to Fatwire. So yeah. Um, it was funny because we went from an earlier version of Fatwire over to Stellan and then back to a newer version of Fatwire. So as far as the rationale, I, I don't know. But um, the bottom line is we didn't have access to it. Sure. So the question was, um, when talking to the uh, the product managers, you know, how did we describe the project to them? Whether or not it was a um, you know a straight up migration or something like a brand new website, um, we were trying to be strategic in how we were framing this. So for the most part, we said it was a straight up migration, um, and you know what we said was like your your content will generally be moved over one for one in uh, particular areas where there was actually more changes. So uh, for instance, where someone had an old version of say the pricing table, we were a little bit different in how we, um, how we approached it. So we said, you and I both know that this content is really old. Hey, we've got this really fantastic new um, module to display all this. Would you, wouldn't you like something like that? So yeah, it just depended on, on I guess the state of the content that we were moving over. Uh, so the question was, um, did we get any resistance uh, in using the physical space? No. Um, generally speaking, it was it was pretty great. Um, like the the developers themselves, they didn't necessarily need to use that, but they al always use that as a reference. So for for us, it was primarily say myself and the visual designer. So we would throw up our stuff all over the place. Um, what was really effective was I think back here there was a giant IA that we printed up and the, so if you just see in the corner, um, that was sort of a blown up A0 version of the, uh, of the IA that we, we put together. And basically the producers use that as their, as their reference point. So they would often just get together in the morning and say, okay, you take this section, you take this section, et cetera, et cetera. So I uh, know it was generally well received. Sure. I guess um, we were fortunate that the people editing the content were the producers, so it wasn't the end. Sorry, it wasn't the product managers and the marketing guys um, making the changes. So we had a little bit of control in that sense. Um, but also, I guess um, I think the people uh, sort of heading up the project at a, at a higher level were really concerned about performance, and so um, the guys basically said, if you put in WYSIWYG, you'll get all of this bloat. And because we were so mindful of how things were previously, um, yeah, it was just, uh, we knew we didn't want to go down that path because it was almost a step towards uh, enabling source mode, and then we would just have the same problem all over again. They were just they were just using straight up source code. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> so 
So just to make sure I've got the question right, um, did the, how do we prevent, you know, the decay of, of the content? And did we, you know, as part of, you know, as part of the project, did we start educating the people, like, so um, product managers and so on about um, data structures and things like that? Yeah, at a very basic level, it was to get get this off Stellan, um, and I guess the way that the the processes tended to work was, um, you know, the the product managers and so on, they interfaced with updates to the website through the online team, and so um, they didn't care how it was done. Often, they just wanted it done. So, um, you know, we had to like I think the education part wasn't really a high priority for us. It was just we needed to tell them whatever it needs, uh, whatever um, we needed to tell them just to get the job done, and also let them know of the, the benefits. But often they they weren't necessarily directly involved in the process. Cool. Time for a beer. Thank you.